All right, just before we start, could you do us a favor and hit the subscribe button, please? So, another day, another small high riding cross. Nope, MPV, mini MPV. Remember them? Didn't think so. That's because hardly anybody's doing them anymore. Fashion, isn't it? It has to be fashion, right? Because taking an MPV, giving it proportions that make it less practical, shallower glass that makes it more difficult to see out of, and right height that compromises comfort, well, why would you do that stuff if not for fashion? That's the thing, right? If we pull back a bit, eventually we'll see that crossovers, and especially the little ones, are just this season's fashion choice. Street style, if you like, whereas something like this, a small MPV, is basically a onesie. Very comfortable, very practical, but you wouldn't want to be seen in public in one, right? Although not some people in Asda, near the Metro Centre, it turns out. So what the B-Class does, like all good MPVs do, Mercedes calls it a sports tourer, which is utter bullshit is whack a great big body onto a relatively small footprint, albeit one with a fairly substantial wheelbase. The result is not only actual space, you know, like a big boot and good rear leg room, but also a feeling of space, loads of air above your head. That in itself has an innately relaxing quality. This is where I tell you that this B-Class, the new one, is better than the last B-Class by some millimeters, which is, of course, the standard way of making something more spacious. So if you look here, you'll see me sitting behind my particular driver driving position, um, six foot four by the way. And then if you look at the boot spaces of these standard family hatchbacks by volume, including the A class on which the B class here is based, you'll see that you're gaining space. Also the boots useful, you know, nets and multi-level floor and a reversible bit of carpet with more rubber on one side for dogs or chickens or something, all useful stuff. And up here, it's similar. It's like a pool table, <clears throat> pockets everywhere. And I think I get accused of being a wannabe comedian. Honestly, man. Also though, it's actually lovely up here in pure design terms. In my subjective opinion, that is. I know you might hate it. Don't know why you would, but you might. The proportion of soft, touchy stuff in here is significant. Also, proper techy. There's loads of ambient lighting strips and you can change their color. And generally you can just tell that Mercedes has put a lot of thought into making this an interesting place to be. Not least because of this wazzle pair of screens which remain pretty much the most impressive thing about being in a Mercedes these days. They house a highly customizable and high definition digital instrument panel in front of you and then adjacent to that, a touchscreen multimedia interface called Mmbox. Mmbox. So that can be controlled by touch or by the touchpad in the center console, so you get a choice. It does take a little bit of getting used to, but once you do, you will appreciate just how well designed the software is. It all looks brilliant and it is easy to use, but if you can't be bothered to do that, then you can talk to the car instead. Hey Mercedes. Hey Mercedes. Hey Mercedes. No, this doesn't have it. Now, if you get a lower level one of these, the screens are smaller, so you get this big dopey bit of plastic around them. But it remains a modern twin screen display, so it doesn't mess with what is fundamentally a very nicely designed cabin. And one that makes you... Forget about the price Yeah, let's do that thing, the whole cost thing. So it's a Mercedes-Benz in it, so it, in it cheap, in it. But actually, it's not monstrously expensive either, in it. For starters, you'll only pay a few hundred quid more for a B-Class over an equivalent a class. So if you have a look at these two examples here, you'll see how that pans out. And even if you just look at the boot capacity lift that you get, that looks like great value. Now the maximum boot figure in particular gives you an indication of how much more spacious this is than an A class. The other thing to think about is that the declining popularity of the old mini MPV here means that this basically exists in a class of just two. Uh -huh, there's this and there's this. Although there is arguably this too, but I don't want to get into a whole what does premium actually mean type argument. You can do it in the comments if you like. Funnily enough, the B-Class and the Active Tourer are priced roughly on the same cricket pitch. I'm sure BMW and Mercedes are like spying on each other. Anyways, what this all means is that if you're looking for something that's a bit fancy pants, but that looks and behaves like it's a retirement wagon that was built in Korea, say, and also that isn't a 4x4, then this is your choice. So, all good, right? This is reasonably well priced, but mainly it's big and it's practical and it's fancy. A Waitrose onesie, if you like. Winner, winner, quinoa dinner. You see it coming, right? 
the big butt. I like big... Well, it's not big butt by any means. I just think that this is a bit clumsy to drive, has a few easily avoidable flaws, and is as boring and predictable as a car journalist calling an MPV boring and predictable. For me though, there are a couple of very fundamental niggles with the driving experience. Not catastrophic ones, just little things. And then there are some issues that you can address by just buying the right version of this car. Oh yeah, spec. There seem to be a gazillion of these, like there are all Mercedes's, but it can be broken down basically into three trims, which you can see here. I'm not gonna go through the spare because it's boring, and if you want to know, you can go to mercedesinternetwebsite.co.uk and you'll find out everything that you need to know there. But what I will say is that the last of those trims is the first and possibly main problem with this car. Why the cock would you want an AMG Line B-Class? I sort of get it, but for me, Turning up a B-Class with AMG Line anything is like drawing a six pack onto your onesie. So of course this is an AMG Line car. And the only tangible effect it has, apart from AMG being written on the floor mats, is to mess up the ride quality. Bigger rim size and smaller sidewalls on the tire seem to be exacerbating a fundamental problem that this has with a ride. You will often hear reviewers saying this about big wheels messing up comfort, right? And although I have nothing to compare this to, because I haven't driven a B-Class on smaller wheels, it's a slightly unusual combination of slack body control with harshness underneath. The car never quite it seems to settle down, but at the same time, we've always got this underlying Flintstones quality. Beat the Flintstones, the stone. It's not bad enough to ruin the car by any means, and it's not something that you'll necessarily notice all the time, but generally, it does feel like this car needs to be softer, which it is if you don't get the AMG line car with its dynamically tuned lowered suspension. Your basic B class is going to have thicker sidewalls and more given the suspension, which will make it roll a little bit more, but does cornering really matter in a car like this? The answer is no. So with a lower level B-Class, you're just gonna get better comfort. Also, there are driving modes, which are utterly, utterly pointless in a standard fit. Now, you might think that I'm about to say it's because it makes everything all stiff and horrible and unnecessarily sporty, but it's not. It's because I honestly can't tell what the difference is when you put it into sport mode. It follows then that this isn't great at drive. It feels tall and cumbersome. But then again, you would expect that from a car like this. Bigger problems are just the little foibles that get in the way of this feeling like the big and luxurious car that the cabin suggests that it should be. So for example, the steering wheel and the pedals seem to be quite close together on the same sort of vertical plane. That means you'll want to push your chair back to get the pedals far enough, but then the steering wheel seems a bit too far away. So then if you're going closer, it's a bit van-like the driving position, just a little bit, not much. I think that's probably something that's more specific to longer-legged people like me though, so we'll not dwell on that. More importantly, there's the gearbox, or rather this particular gearbox and engine combo. Let's break and do that thing now, the engine thing. Quite a lot of choice as you can see, and there's also a plug-in hybrid coming very shortly. As I stand here now, it's next month. October. Today we're going to focus on the car that I'm driving, which makes sense, right? But before we cut back to the car, what I will say is that the lads in the office reckon that the basic petrol one is really good and probably best suited to this car, assuming you're just going to use it as like a chunky runabout. This engine though, I don't know, I do know really I'd be a pretty sh reviewer if I didn't, right? Let's not go down that rabbit hole. It's a good engine and it's got a huge amount of mid-range pull and it's really quiet at lower revs, okay? But every time I drive a diesel these days, especially in a smaller car, I just end up thinking about how much better it would be if the car had like a small capacity turbo petrol engine or was an electric car, to be honest. I just yearn for that quietness and smoothness that they're never able to quite engineer out of a diesel car. The problem I have with this engine in particular is that much like the driving experience itself, it's just a little bit cack handed. Now it has a new 8 speed twin clutch automatic and it's okay, it's quick shifting and that once you get going, but it's also a bit hesitant at lower speeds and the car in general is a bit lethargic when you're pulling away from junctions. It's got this slightly frustrating elastic power delivery where you kind of get nothing and all of a sudden boom you get all the mid range and there is a lot of it with this engine. You get this big lump of torque that feels a bit uncouth and it's quite clattery from the mid range onwards too which is quite surprising because A, the four cylinder diesels that Mercedes is doing in the C class are brilliant and don't seem to suffer from that and B, this is really quiet at the low end of the rev range so it goes from that to being like, quite noisy. So ultimately you've got all that stuff, you've got the engine's power delivery and the gearbox being a bit dim-witted and the hard ride and overlight steering as well and the fact that even though there's loads of glass, right, so it's a very airy cabin, the dashboard's so chunky and long that you seem like you're miles back from the corners of the car and that makes them a little bit difficult to judge. All that just makes it feel a bit disjointed, you know? Having said that, my missus 
Mrs. Nichols just called. She loves the B-Class. None of this stuff bothers her at all. She just sees the automatic gearbox, the elevated driving position, the spaciousness, the fact that it's a Mercedes, and the really lovely cabin. Now, I know that probably makes me sound like a patronizing ball bag. What I mean is that lots of people of all the genders will see this car exactly like that. They'll see the bigger picture, and I get that. Because actually, that's the way I see the BMW version of this car, the 2 Series Active Tourer. It's all wrong, that car. It's a front-wheel drive mini MPV with a BMW badge on the front somehow. I wanted to hate that car before I drove it, but I ended up proper liking it because they've just done it really well. High driving position, space, easy to park, lovely cabin, dead high quality, no pretense. It was a combination of things that I just connected with in a way that I should have with this, but just haven't. Which is a shame because, again, plenty about this Lordy Arst A-Class, the A-Class itself being another car that I really do like, is mega. So to go back to what I said before, my advice to you would be to spec this car very carefully and to test drive the one that you are going to buy specifically. Because I reckon that if you get a base level one, that'll do you just fine. Less than 30 grand, boom. Or just get the BMW one, like. Or get a nice Kia Karens and drive it to Blackpool for a lovely holiday with the money you've saved. There you go, B-Class. Thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed it. Really appreciate your time. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already and tell your friends about us. We need to get bigger. I'll see you soon, bye. Also, it's got driving modes, but they're completely pointless. Why do people put traffic announcements on? Has anybody ever been driving along and a traffic announcement's come on and it's related to exactly the road they're driving on and a traffic jam that they are about to hit? If that's happened to you, please let us know below. All traffic announcements actually do is ruin the song that you're listening to with some local radio announcement for a road that's fucking miles away. <laughs> Rant over.